Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Good Stuff. I'm Kevin Billy, and as always, we appreciate you joining us. Well, hey, this is a this is a special edition and a first time edition because today's guest is also a host of a podcast, which he's going to tell you about as he welcomes his listeners. So, kind of a dual podcast, and I'm going to welcome in uh, Travis. Wyckoff, uh, maybe you can tell us a little secret to that name, Travis, for me remembering your last name of Kingdom Coaching. Travis, good to have you, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, great to be here. Excited to uh, to join you. And yeah, this is a first for me where we're doing kind of a, a, a dual thing. As you mentioned, um, Kevin, I host uh, Coaching DNA podcast and I uh, have a consulting business, uh, Kingdom Coaching um, doing much of the same work that you're doing, very similar work that you're doing. So, um, yeah, pumped to be here. Yeah. And the last name is why cough. Um, so why did you cough is, is maybe an easy way to, to remember that. So yeah, excited to talk to, to, uh, for my listeners to hear your story, your background, um, but also get into some leadership and, and talk leadership and what we're learning and what we're seeing. So, um, really excited, um, Kevin. I'm gonna um, maybe give some background for for both listeners. You and I met in Florida. Uh, what was it? February of 2021. So this yeah, February March maybe. I don't remember, but it's almost been a year, huh? Almost a year. We're in Florida. We went to um, a uh, think tank. Uh, it's called an Exonus Summit. Uh, a friend of both of ours, Kyle Stark, hosted this. We connected. I think we had dinner that first night, a group of us. And uh, anyways, long story short, here we are um, thinking about that Oxana summit that, that Kyle hosted um, and thinking through again. Yeah, like just what 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 a great um, what a great space to to connect to other people, other like minded people. And so when I come out of that that uh, Oxana summit. Uh, one of the things that I have is like some some guys that I'm like, all right, I got to stay connected to these dudes because mm-hmm. uh, they're really sharp and they're like minded. And so um, out of out of that comes uh, our connection and our friendship. So anyways, yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, that was a great event. Right. I mean, I remember when um, getting to know Kyle had him on the podcast. He texted me and he says, I'm going to send you an email about an event. And I checked it out like 15 minutes later. And I looked at it and I just hit reply. I'm like, I'm in. I'm not even asking my wife, right? <laughs> but, you know, and, and you never know when you go to those events, uh, Travis. I don't know about you, but, you know, I was a little nervous. And, and going down there, I saw the list. I think he emailed us out like a week before. And it's like, oh, man, I'm definitely going to be the dumbest guy in the room. But I know how good that is. And so you get down there and, and some people already knew each other and connected and, uh, I'm an extrovert, but probably a part of me is an introvert there because it's like a little nerve rattling to get to know some of those people, right? But man, right away, I, I think from the speed dating from, from day one, you know, to the dinner night one, it just seems like you gravitate to certain people, like you mentioned. Um, but I think as we've talked about a number of times, I was really impressed, you know, with the ability that everybody brought to the table there, you know, wanting to grow and learn. And just helping everybody out. And, and it was, as you continue to go throughout the course of the three days that we were down there, it's just amazing the commonality, isn't it? That all the things that we're dealing with, struggling with, whatever it might be, they're, they're very similar. Um, but I, I think, as we were also talking a little bit again before we got on air, I was really impressed mainly with Kyle's leadership trying to get us to, to simplify and, and provide clarity to the things that we were doing. And I love the variety of topics. I don't know about you, but did you feel like even when you left, in terms of those relationships that you continue on with, it's just constantly sharpening one another, isn't it? And just finding something different. Maybe even if it's one thing that I take away from every phone call with you. you, Does that resonate with you? Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, Yeah, it's it's honestly why I am probably pretty particular. Like I'm going to, there's people that I'm just going to do whatever I have to do to get around. Like, I'm going to call this person. I'm going to bug this person. I, I can just real quick right now think of three or four people that I have been connected to somehow, some way that I walk away thinking, all right, I need to, I need to stay connected to that person because they sharpen me. They, they make me better. They have, uh, 
the way they articulate things really resonate. I can learn from them. And so, yeah, it's a, um, it's a constant sharpening. And so I'm super intentional of, of, about that. And you're one of the guys that came out of that uh, Oksana summit that I thought I got to, I got to hang with this guy. I got to stay connected to him. Yeah. Yeah. That resonates with me as well. Well, Hey, let's, let's talk a little bit, Travis, first, before we get to, you know, maybe some leadership talks some things we've learned with the podcast from, from our coaching consulting, however you want to call it. You know, I, I think when I think of you and, and I think of myself, there's a lot of similarities. I'm sure that'll come out here, but, but you're more on the baseball world and I'm on the basketball world. Um, and then other than the fact that you have a lot more hair than I do right now, too. So tell us a little bit, just just tell us a little bit about your journey, your story. I, I love I love for people to hear where, where you've been, you know, and, and just where you're going with everything right now. Yeah, love it. So grew up in a little town in southern Kansas, played uh, college baseball at Wichita State for four years, spent a couple years in the minor leagues and then uh, started coaching. I, I coached college baseball for 11 years. I uh, spent some time at the University of Iowa, Creighton University. I was a junior college head coach and then spent um, the last three years of my coaching career uh, here in the Dallas area, Dallas Baptist University, and uh, got out of coaching, really felt a call to, to get out of coaching, and um, actually was going to a church while I was coaching and getting to know the lead pastor there, a guy by the name of Rodney Hobbs. And uh, so we connect. It was a it was a church plant. So it was a smaller church. He and I became friends and just connected on a consistent basis. Well, I get out of coaching and uh, several months later, Rodney uh, offers me a job. I had no seminary background. Um, I chuckled when he had, when he had offered me the job. We we're at a Starbucks and I, I literally started laughing. I'm like, dude, I got no seminary background. He's like, I don't care. Like you love Jesus. You want to grow. Uh, you I, I'm, I want good people on my, on my staff. So are you, are you in? So long story short, I spent six years, um, on a church staff, really six pivotal years for me. I saw what it looks like to, de to get developed. I saw what it looks like to develop people. I saw what it looked like to develop systems and processes to grow. Um, I saw what it looked like to grow in self-awareness. I just, it was a, a key pivotal, uh, six years of my life. Then uh, that kind of that that time ended at Stonegate and I started uh, Kingdom Coaching now, which is what I'm doing. I started that a little over four years ago. And at the end of the day, um, my my heart, my passion, my desire is to walk with leaders. Um, and, and that looks that looks different ways for different different leaders. Some with some leaders, I'm uh, what one guy called a, a thought partner with with others. Maybe I'm maybe more of a mentor, maybe with some younger leaders. I'm a. I'm a sounding board. I'm a, um, you know, I hope I equip and, and, and help and add value to, uh, to leaders. It's, it's interesting. I always say it's funny how all of a sudden you turn 23 and you're no longer in college and you don't need a coach anymore. But yet before that, it was like coaching was huge. And all of a sudden coaching uh, doesn't, doesn't matter after that. And my, in my experience has been, man, I, I need a coach. I need, I need people in my life that can help navigate the stress and strains and the, and the things we go through. So long story short, now I walk with coaches. I, uh, I have a consulting business, again, Kingdom Coaching, where uh, I work with coaches, athletic directors, and I'm getting in the uh, executive space here recently, uh, or I should say in the corporate space, doing some executive coaching, which I love. It's been great. Leadership is leadership. Um, there's some nuanced differences, obviously. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's uh, I think leadership's pretty uh, pretty across the board. The same stress and strains that coaches have are, are the same ones that executives have. Executives have. So um, about three years ago, I started coaching DNA, the podcast. So I run that in kind of uh, conjunction with my um, with my consulting business. And probably really the reason why I started is I just wanted to learn from people. Yeah. And it's right, kind of right. weird. It's kind of weird to call somebody and say, Hey, you want to hop on a phone call for 45 minutes? So I'm like, ding, ding, ding. Let's just start a podcast. So I have a front to, uh, to talk to some of the smartest people around and learn from them. So that's my story. Uh, love what I'm doing. I feel like I'm called to it and, and really passionate about it. I don't feel like I've worked a day uh, in the last four and a half years, actually, uh, I don't feel like I've worked much in my whole life because I've loved what I've done. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's me. Now I'm going to turn the tables. And this is how I will uh, ask you 
Kevin, I always start my podcast with, dude, take us uh, on a journey from, from high school to present day. Yeah, boy, like I said, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot, a lot of similarities, Travis. I mean, uh, uh, I, I played baseball and basketball and uh, decided on playing basketball in college. I uh, was thinking about baseball both, but uh, I stuck with basketball. was very fortunate to go into a, a winning program. Uh, so, yeah, we, we won all four years, which makes it nice, right? But uh, was able to play overseas in Germany and then came back, and I just I wanted to get into coaching right away. I was a graduate assistant at the same school, Walsh University, uh, near Canton, Ohio. And uh, so I was a graduate assistant there for two years. Got my master's. Uh, I went out to Tiffin, which is west, about two hours. I was there, oh boy, nine, ten months. And then uh, Notre Dame College. It was a uh, NEI school at the time in Cleveland, Ohio. And had been an all-girls institution. Just recently went co-ed for two years. They were nine and forty-nine overall, and zero and thirty in the league. So that job came open. The soccer coach there was. Uh, well, I think he was, he's probably a dozen years older than I am or so, but we went to college together. He was from England, played soccer. And uh, yeah, he let me know about the job. And I think there was over like 200 people that applied. And so I didn't really think I had much of a choice. Uh, but lo and behold, uh, about a month and a half after the process, I was the head coach at 25 years old. And as I've said numerous times, I thought I knew everything and knew nothing, you know. <laughs> uh, but spent 10 years there, loved it. Should have retired after the first game we won in the league, but um, it was a great experience. Also became the assistant AD the last four years there, just because I wanted to get into some administration at some point in my life. Uh, while we were there, uh, I was married, had two kids, and then uh, decided to come home after 10 years to the high school that, that I was from. Had an opportunity to be the AD full-time and uh, the boys' basketball coach. So we spent six years there. And that time had our third child, so we now have three boys. And um, yeah, much like you, I felt the same thing. I just, I, I never felt like I worked a day in my life. I enjoyed it. The, the, the high school job was a little difficult for me, um, you know, in terms of culture, in terms of some other things that I was just used to, but a great, great learning experience. Uh, when I look back at those six years, I, I really felt like uh, there was so much that I got out of that experience. It didn't seem like it at the time, but uh, I think that's that's how the Lord works. And so I'm uh, very grateful for that opportunity. Unfortunately, it ended December. I had uh, I had neck surgery after about six months of just tons of pain. So uh, I ended that and then uh, had the choice to move on. And so when I moved on, I uh, I found uh, a small business, ironically, like five minutes from my house that I didn't really know much about. They offered me uh, to become the general manager. Uh, of, a, of a small business and man what what great timing that was ironically about two weeks before I was hired he wanted to hire me I had a trip planned Travis up to Boston I told my wife it had been a long year with the job and with the neck I had to get away and get in the gym you know and so uh, uh, I, yeah I missed it at that time getting in the gym it's just the connection and being around people and uh, the practice and so I went up to Celtics training camp for a couple of days and long story short, that's where when I was up there, I'm like, OK, I wasn't really thinking of it as a big deal. But it's like as you start looking at all the banners and everything else like this is this is pretty this is a pretty cool thing. Right. Like, all right, God, like what, what is it? What, what can I do? How, how can I take all these places I've been? How can I take these people that I've talked to and, and built relationships with? And how can I pour that? You know, how can I pour that into other people? Well, the obvious answer is a podcast, right? Everybody, everybody has one or starts one. You just got to keep it going. That's the tough part. But I came back, started that job, and didn't really think anything of it. Um, just continue to think and pray on it. And so then COVID hit. And it's like, all right, we're going to hop on a screen. We got no idea what we're doing. I mean, if you go back and listen, and I know if we're still good, Travis, but the first couple, I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, just started connecting with people that, that I knew. I called Kevin Eastman of the Celtics, or he used to be of the Celtics and Clippers, and boom, he's like, yeah, I'll hop on. And I think the, the timing of it all, it's, it's so funny to me now because I don't know if there's as much availability for something like that if COVID doesn't come. You know, it's like, well, we're sitting at home. Yeah, sure, I'd love to hop on. And then boom, it was the, it was the domino effect, right? One person led to the next, and, and here we are, which is episode 72. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, after about... 
almost two years, I would say about after a year and a half, I, I just, you know, my, my wife and I were, were talking and just, you know, I, I bet we prayed on this for three, four months to your point, Travis, it just, it just was something that I felt called and led to. Um, I, it was really, really hard. I didn't want to leave the place I was at. I loved it there. But as of two months ago, I've started, you know, with the coaching, uh, the speaking right now um, and, and doing that, obviously maintaining the podcast and doing that. We're kind of we're kind of flip flop, I guess. I'm in the business world more so, you know, I'm in a very, very unique area. And so there were a lot of good relationships that I have established. Uh, I think at the foundation, we had a lot of the same values that we share. But like you said, it's like, hey, how can how can we help each other get better? You know, sometimes leaders just need to, to talk and throw up on you, I would say. And they just need somebody to give them a different, maybe a different opinion, a different angle, uh, ask some questions, push back, hold them accountable. Right. Um, and so I, I think that's really what it is and what it's become. Um, I have dealt with one uh, coach and her team. I would, I would love more eventually, but I'm, I'm staying pretty busy right now. But uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think it's I, I think it's just it's a blessing to wake up every morning and have the opportunity, you know, to just try and help and pour into other people. But I also think to your point as I close up, sorry, that was a little long winded, but I, I think it's it's crucial to be around people like you and Kyle and other people in my life that are pouring into me, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not able to do that to them if I'm not if I'm not doing that. So yeah, there you go. That's 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 what it is. What's your what was your uh top couple strengths as a coach slash leader um when you were when you were coaching? What are your strengths? What yeah, what how how are you wired and gifted that allowed you to have success? I can tell you all the weaknesses. Um I think that uh, I mean, first off, I, I really think that that I had a true passion for the game. Um, I think that that that's something that and just a passion for for kids. I just always wanted to be around kids and help out and pour into them. Um, and so I, I think I also think like I am a um, I just love the day. Like I love the practice. I, I love just being present with that and try and get better. I, I think that was a that was a big thing as well. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe it goes without being said, but I, I, I do think a work ethic, I think that has to, that has to be there. I, I think it's first one in the gym, last one to leave and just separating yourself in that, in that way. Um, I think, I think I, I did a great job at connecting in terms of relationships with them as a player, but not always as a person, you know, that's probably the biggest one you realize later in life, but th those would be a couple that come to mind. What, what about you? I would love to hear that as well. Let, let's just, play a game of tennis here with maybe some of the yeah. same questions like what well, what do you feel you know what do you feel you know where where did you add that that value and, and do you see any similarities the second part of that question for me would be do you see any similarities with what you're doing now and, and, and some of those same things coming out or have those continually gotten better maybe yeah yeah so I think for 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 me probably the the giftings that I've had that that um have helped is I can generally connect with people um, regardless of race or regardless of age. Regard, I just have been able to, to kind of connect with people, which has been obviously helpful when you're dealing with people. And then I think the second one that comes to mind is um, have a decent a, a awareness of or feel for, you know, what people are like some emotional intelligence, I think would probably be the short way. I think I can read people well. I think I, uh, one of my strengths as a coach was was figuring out, okay, what's what's going on under the surface and how how do I tap into them? How do I get them to believe that they can compete at a really high level? So that emotional intelligence, that reading people, that figuring out buttons to push, maybe building in into them some confidence. Um, yeah, those those two things probably stick out the most. And I think it probably translates to what I'm doing now with with leaders being able to connect. Um, I've grown in, in my patience and my ability to listen. I don't know how great I, I was with that. Um, so I've grown in that and, um, the, the, the ability to read people, the ability to have emotional intelligence, the ability to, to have a sense of maybe what is, I always say what's underneath the surface level, because everything on the surface points to a deeper, 
a, d- a deeper area that that probably needs to be uprooted or or dealt with. And so, uh, yeah, I've just kind of always had a, a knack um, to 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 see that knack that's grown as I've learned my own self, as I've grown in my own self awareness. So, yeah, I think those are the kind of the the couple things that come to come to my mind. Let me. Okay, did, did you have a follow up? Because I want. Oh, I've got a question for you. Go ahead. Um, when you think through at now that you, you know what you're doing and as you're working with leaders, I'll ask a very 30,000 foot view. What are the commonalities? What are some of the similarities you're seeing with the really, really good leaders that you're working with or you're, you're around? Yeah. I mean, I, I was thinking about this when, when I knew you and I were going to do this and it's, it's funny because I would, I would say Answering this question, coupled with interviewing people on the podcast, I knew there was different ways to do things, but now it's just blown my mind that literally after interviewing 71 people, that they they all do something different, you know, and I, I think the thing that I admire is they got a great deal of conviction in what that is, and and I'm going to rattle off a couple. I don't, I don't know that there's there's 10 right ones or 20 right ones here, but I think this is kind of going to be the gist of the conversation today. Um, I, I think I think authenticity is a big one, you know, just being yourself. That 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 one's huge. And I don't I don't think these are in any order, Travis. Um, but I know that's one at least in, in my walk that that I I think is is really really important. Um, the one that, that I would struggle with that, that I admire in a lot of really good leaders that I've been around is their consistency. Um, that that's a big one. I think that's difficult. I I look back, man, when I was 25 years old, I was in one mood when we won three in a row and I was in one mood when we lost four in a row, you know, like just not having that, that consistency probably more than anything though, I guess, as I'm thinking about it. I just think these people have the ability to to just do whatever it is that they're doing. It's just a daily discipline. And they just do that better than anybody else. It doesn't mean that they don't have any bad days or maybe take days off, but it's it's almost as if they give themselves that grace and that they're more concerned with that consistency over intensity over times. Yeah. So, you know, they're just really, really good at what I what I would say. They just win their day and then they do it again tomorrow. They Yesterday's over. They can't control tomorrow, and 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 then uh, they're focused on today. <clears throat> um, and one other one, I just said that word too. I think control is a big one. I, I think they're really focused on the things that they can control versus the things that they don't control. That that's just. I would say that's you know it's like I always told the guys in the locker room like that's noise, right? Just ignore the noise. It doesn't it doesn't help. In fact, it, it probably hinders. So I, I guess there's probably more, but we, we could start there. I mean, what would you say to those? I mean, are you seeing some commonalities as well there that, that rise to you when you're doing your podcast or coaching? Yeah, I, I love those. I, I would, as I, as I hear those, I, the one thing that has resonated with me so deeply over the last probably nine months or so and, and and I heard it before for whatever reason it just landed differently, and so the more I look at even the things that you said, I think if you pull up one level and think through, I I think through the the elite leaders that I'm around or interview, they have a they can build trust. They just win trust in their in their program, That's and good. so I think in order like I'm just going to use your list in order to uh, will, build trust and have people really trust you, you better be authentic. You know, if you're inauthentic, you got no shot to to build trust. If you're not consistent, if you're like, to your point, crazy one day, laughing the next, moody the next, snapping the next, you get that's it's too it's it's like whiplash for people. They don't know what to expect. It's hard to build trust. So um I think building trust, I think they I think there's trust built. Now, this is the interesting thing is I think I think we all have some lead tools. I think we have some key key uh, tools that we use to build trust. And I used to think it was just connection. Like you've got to be able to build relationships with the people that you're leading so that they trust you and obviously hopefully you trust them as a leader. And then I look at some people that I'm like, well, they're not super connectors. Like they're not they're not like 
bro hugging all their athletes as they come into the locker room. Like, how are they? But they're winning trust. So how are they winning trust? And, you know, I use, you look, I just use a guy named Pat Murphy at uh, Alabama, softball coach at Alabama. And that dude's a relational savant. Kevin Hambly at Stanford, relational savant. You, you, you meet him and you're like, dude, I love those guys. Well, not everybody's wired like that. So what, a, how else are people building trust or winning trust, which I think is the number one thing. Like if you can't build trust, if there's a crack in, in trust, you, your, your program's you're just not going to perform at a high level. It might not implode, but it's not going to maximize its potential. So I'll I'll speed this up. Connection, clarity. I think bringing clarity, you you mentioned it earlier, having uh, like a Tim Corbin at Vanderbilt baseball, dude, he brings so much clarity on the big things, who they are, what they're, where they're going, what they stand for, their vision, the values, all that. He, He brings clarity there. He also brings clarity on like, um, the, the daily, like, Hey, we're going to clean our dugouts in, in December, as we shut down for the a couple months for the winter, a picture's hanging up over on their board on how to clean the dugout, what it should look like when it's done. Um, that might seem like a small thing, but dude, he just brings clarity. And then the, and then the last area that I think people lead the, the lead tool that people used is competency. I think some people are just, they just, out X and O people, or they, they put their guys or gals in a position to have great success because of how they coach. Um, and that's, that wins trust. Like when, when your coach can get you better, you, you just, you're probably going to trust them more. I think we need all three. I think we all need to connect. I think we all need to bring clarity. And I think we all need to, to be competent and to be able to coach at a high level. I think some people, um, have, have just, we have different lead tools. Like my lead tool to win trust was connection. Yeah. Uh, a guy by the name of, of Dan Hefner, who's the head baseball coach at Dallas Baptist, his lead tool is competent. If you go to Dallas Baptist as a hitter, you're, you're going to leave there with, let me rephrase it in about two weeks, you stepping on campus, you're going to look up and think, Holy cow, I'm already better. Like I've spent two weeks in the cages with this guy He's got my body moving in ways that I never thought it could move. He's got, like, I trust that dude. So Dan's lead tool is competence. It doesn't mean that he doesn't connect. It doesn't mean that he's not clear. It just means his lead tool is is competence. He does those other things. So anyways, I think that is the one thing that I see. And then your your list of things, I think, totally, as as I'm listening, they fit right, uh, like, yes, you, if you're not authentic, people don't trust you. There's zero right. shot. If you don't have trust, you, you, you're going to, you're going to lower the, 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 the bar that you can reach. I think you're going to not maximize your potential. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I want to, I, I got two things that I want to touch on to what you said, or just follow up. Where, where are you seeing leaders when it comes to vulnerability? Like for me, and I love how you, that, that's really good how you have that, Travis, with connection to clarity and the, the competency. And that's that's going to kind of be my next one. Um, but like, where where do these leaders stand with, with being vulnerable? Because I know that's one that uh, I'll just, you know, that, that's, that's, you talk about trust. I mean, I, I, mean, I build trust fast. <laughs> that's just who I am. You know, I, I look at like my wife and our, in my house, it takes her a little bit longer. It's how we're wired. It's that connection piece. But I think the authenticity, the vulnerability, hey, I'm going to be transparent with you. You know, I'm willing to do that. And it's okay if I get hurt, I'll move on. That person's not in my foxhole anymore. But I guess that's one thing that I feel is missing right now as leaders is just that vulnerability to to be able to say, hey, I don't know, or hey, this is hard, or hey, I screwed up. What, what are you seeing in your world when it comes to that? And is that, once again, is that something that's resonating with you at all? Yeah, I, I think, th- I think we're all on a spectrum of that. Like I, when I think through, as you're asking me that question, I'm going through the, the Rolodex of people that I've been around and or worked with, or, or like you said, interviewed. And if they're on a spectrum, some people are just really, really vulnerable. Those seem to be the, the higher the vulnerability seems to be the more relational they are. The lower the vulnerability seems to be that that's not their lead tool. Like I can think of some guys right now that are not their their lead tool or even their secondary tool. Maybe it's the third one 
the, the is not its connection. Like, so their, their connection is not their main way that they build trust. So they're probably going to be slightly lower on the spectrum. I think you better be on the spectrum. I don't think you have to be like every day, you know, a tearjerker, a, a completely open book. I don't think you have to be like that. But if you don't have some semblance of like vulnerability and authenticity, just some honesty of like, guys, I'm, I'm going to wear that one. That was on me, dude. I blew that. This is not good. Or man, guys, honestly, the week of practice, it's on me. I poor job leading. I own it. I wear it. I'm struggling in that. You know, if you don't have some ability to do that, I don't think, I think it falls on deaf ears. I actually think, tell me what you think. I think vulnerability is increasing because I don't remember in the nineties, anybody ever talking about coaches being vulnerable. No, I would agree with you. Yeah. It's just like you had to put on that front or be a tough guy. Right. I mean, it was like your, it was like your pride was being challenged or something, you know, but, um, and I don't know how much it is definitely, it's definitely more than what it's been. Um, and I, I think it probably does come down to personalities like you're mentioning where they're at on that spectrum as you would allude to, but it's definitely something that I think can continue to get better, you know, and, and just listen, it's tough. I, I've, I've done what you said. I've sat in front of a, a, a locker room full of guys and a staff and you're on a four game losing streak and I'm on that island way over there and nobody's believing in you. And you got to say, Hey, listen, man, this is, this is on me. I, I screwed this up. This offense isn't going to work, but we're going to make it work. And I don't think that's always easy to do. Uh, I guess I would just encourage leaders that are listening. There's nothing wrong with that. And to be more vulnerable with your group of people, because I think that's just you being authentic and, and um, you know, I, I think that's a huge thing. And so I know I encourage people when it, when it comes to that, I do. I, I want to one other thing before I forget. When you were talking about the connection, the clarity, and the competency, one thing that I was good at was X's and O's. It just came so natural to me. I can pick up a board in the middle of the game and design something just based on what I've been seeing and have it out in 30 seconds. And that was maybe a way of connecting. But what would you say to the the, the fact that that probably was building some trust? Hey, I was really good at this part, Travis, but. I was only connecting when it came to that competency. I wasn't getting outside of that world and connecting on. I think I alluded to that to you earlier. I wasn't connect. You came in the next day after a game. Hey, Travis, I stayed up last night because back in the day, you had to do more, right? It wasn't, he was breaking down these tapes. I stayed up three hours, you know, until three in the morning and I got your 10 shots. Let's talk about them. We'd have that conversation. You'd leave the office. And I felt pretty good about what I did. Then I'm like, man, he, why doesn't he care what I did? Well, because he just broke up as a girlfriend. He's just got a D minus on his test. You know, he's struggling right now. He's missing home. Does that make sense when I'm asking though? Because I felt like I was building trust with that competency, but sometimes that competency was hurting my ability to connect at the surface. Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, I think, I think this, I think, I think you got to flip the, the, the tables. I think it's really important for coaches to know what is my lead tool? What's my secondary tool? And what's my tertiary tool? So for, for you, you, you said connection was your top one, correct? Right. Sounds like competence was two clarity was three. Yeah. So one of the ways that I look at it is I think you need to double down on your lead tool, whatever that is. Double down on it because you want to you want to you want to dance with your strengths, man. That is what got like leverage those strengths. I do think you want to improve your your secondary and, and tertiary tool, your your second and third tool, because I think that lowers the I think that raises the 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 floor, so to speak. I think it prevents some of those trust cracks from happening. So then I think you turn the table. And I think you've got to look at your athletes and you've got to figure out, does this guy need a bro hug and how's your family doing? Or does this guy need a, a, a 15 minute X and O session, or does he need me to go rebound and watch some film on his shot? 
or does he need clarity on his role and what what we see of him going forward? So I think it depends on on the player. This is why I think each coach has to have three tools. I think we all have a lead tool, but you better have all three of them. And then when you turn like so knowing yourself, but then looking at athletes and figuring out. So so here's a story. I was I was on this call with Dave Aranda and some other coaches, and he talked about um, going from Wisconsin to LSU and he was the LSU defensive coordinator. And he said that uh, on that defense, when he first got there, there were, there were some, I can't remember if these were his exact words, but something to the effect, like these are alpha male, like big game predator hunters. Like these are dudes. These, these are guys that like, are like, dude, get me to the NFL. And he talked, uh, he talked about like this idea of like, they they weren't super concerned with like building this intimate relationship with the coach. They wanted the coach to put him them in a position where they can make plays so they can win games so they can make millions of dollars. In, in a, and I don't say that negatively. I think no, that's, no, 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 you're, yeah. when you're at that level, dude, it's like, yeah. hey, we can bro hug all we want. You put me in position to make plays. And that's going to win the trust. Eventually, then you start building a connection different ways. So I think you've got to know what your athletes need. What is this? What's what's as a leader? Does this person need me to just like take them out to the to the campus dining hall and have lunch with them and just check in on them? Or does he need to like get clarity or does he need X no help? So does that make sense? That's really, really good. It's it's so funny because uh, over 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 break, somebody asked me. What was the hardest thing about coaching? Well, number one, they're 18 to 22 years old. You never knew what was going to happen, right? But, it, but the next part I told them, I think the, the most, if I'm being vulnerable, and maybe this isn't the same thing for everybody else, and, and I don't know what you think of this, Travis, but it was like what you just said. Well, those three guys needed it on the board. Those three guys needed it, you know, on the floor. These three guys needed it with film. These three guys wanted me to sit down with them. And it's like, there's just 12 guys that I've given you an example to. And when I'm speaking, I'm only hitting a quarter of them. And it's like, so three, you know, 75% of them might not even be listening to me, you know, and trying to assemble all of that and getting them rowing in the same direction. That's not easy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you this, but by the way, are you good for me to pivot slightly? Go right ahead. I'm curious what your thoughts are again, when you're looking at the landscape of leaders, both coaches, but also in, you know, in the business world, are there things that leaders do and, or don't possess that, that really hinders their leadership that just puts a ceiling on their, on their leadership? What are your thoughts on? So we talked about, here's the similarities, what we see in elite leaders. Are there any similarities or any things that you see in, for lack of a better term, non-elite leaders, maybe those those leaders that just aren't cutting it. Do you see anything that is is consistent there? Well, the easy answer is the opposite of everything we've already talked about. <laughs> but right. you know, I think one glaring thing to me um, would be serving. I, I, I think the area that I'm in, the leaders that I'm around serve their people and create an environment where they're just constantly pouring into them. And as a result, you know, the people then pour back into the business. I know that's not like that everywhere, um, but it creates a culture like I've never seen before. I don't, please don't take this statement the wrong way, but I've also, I think a lot of businesses, if they ran their businesses like sports teams, And a lot of the things that are involved in those would have a lot more success. And so when it's that coupled with like that servant leadership and mindset, I mean, I I just think it has the ability just to continue to sustain over time. Um, That that's been something that I've I've really noticed is, man, this guy's just got to get out of the way of himself right now, or it's more about him and what he wants and not listening to his people. Um, It's not pouring into them with a variety of things. I mean, I can give you some examples around here, you know, it's, Hey, it's, it's, let's give them their birthday off and pay them for the day. Hey, let's, let's put a golf simulator in the back room. They can use it anytime they want their families. 
you know, um, they say, hey, we're going to bring in a, a massage, two massage ladies, and you can sit in that chair for 15 minutes throughout the day. You know, just just things like that, that they might not appear to be a big deal, but I think people really appreciate, you know, when their quote unquote boss or leader is pouring into them. And then they're doing everything with a standard of excellence from this is what you need to be successful. You know, I don't care if that's computers. I don't care if that's to keep the workplace safe. I don't care if that's the landscaping around, but there's a consistency with that standard. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I, I think the premise is all based on that, that serving. I, re I really, really do. What explain that. Uh, I want you to flesh out if, if businesses, I did this, I think this was your quote, if businesses would use some of the, what, what coaches do explain that. Well, I just think, um, I just think there's things within the coaching world. Like I, I just look at the recruiting process and what you do in recruiting and, and how, I mean, you know about this, right? I mean, you, you put, you put a lot of time and effort into recruiting an individual into your program. And sometimes and that might be that might be a two year process, right? And of course, there might be times where it's a two month or two week process. Those come up, and I'm not saying that businesses, you know, need to spend two years hiring somebody. That's not possible. But there's a lot of things that go into a process of that to find the right fit and to get it right. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes, but I see so many businesses when it comes to the hiring process, and especially in the world we're in now today. They're just hiring and hiring and hiring, but then they're spending time. And well, first off, they're spending money over and over again. And then the time that it takes them or keeps them away from what they need to do, you know, just really getting, you know, trying to get to the, like you said, connection of building trust right off the bat. I understand that it takes time, but I think there's just certain things that you can do like the process of recruiting. And then once you get them in there, the systems, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of places What's been hard for me is it's like, well, I just assume that they know or have these things already, right? Like, hey, what, what are your values? You know, what, what, what's your vision? You know, what, 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 are you, what are you doing? You know, and then why are you coming here every day? And if I could spend a day with you and you give me a couple hours to meet with 10 different leaders, I'm usually going to have 10 different answers. Where if it's, if it's the Alabama football team, you know, if it's the Vanderbilt baseball team, yep. um, if it's Villanova basketball, everybody knows those things. They, they're, they're clear on those, to your point, in, in terms of clarity. And I think that's huge. I, I think when people, you know, you're, 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 you're pouring into them, you're building that trust, you know, and then you're, you're touching base with them all the time. Like when you're a coach, come on in the office, or you see them in the dorm, or you see them, you're constantly connecting. In fact, I think I would challenge businesses like they should just hire somebody to connect if the leader doesn't want to connect just to touch base with their people and take the temperature all day, every day, Travis. I, I think it just becomes, well, I come here and this is my job. No, like we're all about you. What can I do to make this better? Do you like how things are going? What's your feedback? Like just constantly connecting with them. And so I think of like that whole process from when you get them to recruiting to saying, hey, this is who we are, the sales pitch, this is what we're about, this is what we do, this is why we do it. You know, here's our systems that are in place, you know, to, to justify or support that. And then, you know, these values, they're never going to change while you're here. You know, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. Going back to when you asked me earlier, those leaders have a great deal of conviction of what those are. But the beauty of it, Travis, is they've gotten input from everybody else, too. Everybody else is involved. It's not just this is what we're doing because I said this is what we're doing. So I think I think that's where I would go. There's probably other things that I would go, but hopefully that's making sense. Yeah. Can I? So that, it sounds like you're talking about uh, the environment that's created, the culture that's created with a, a servant heart. Let me ask you this, and you don't have to name a name specifically. You can if you want. When you think through those those companies, those businesses that you've been around, whether you've worked with them or just kind of know them intimately, what is the best culture you've been around? And give me give me some insight into what that culture looked like and, and felt like and, and almost tasted like. Yeah. And, and by the way, you don't have to name the name of the business. No, uh, I mean, there, yeah, there's a couple, there's a couple around here and then there's a couple 
there's a couple sports teams that come to mind. I, I think once again, those leaders just truly care about their people. I, I can't say it enough. It has nothing to do with the product. Like the one place that I go around here that I'm with, I sometimes forget what the product is. You know, yeah. like I, I just, I feel it. You, you, you just, I don't mean this to slight anybody else because you, maybe some people don't get that or feel it, but I know you, you get what I'm saying here, Travis, like, and I'm struggling to explain it, but when you walk in the door, you feel it. You, you, you can just, you can take the temperature of the room and just, I mean, it's, it's sunny and 70 every day, regardless of what's going on. Um, and I think everybody is aligned. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows what I just alluded to, why they're there, what they're doing. Like, hey, we, we, we make outdoor furniture. But man, that outdoor furniture, when you're sitting on that outdoor furniture, you know, Travis, and we're building memories and we're, it's just much more deeper and rooted into that. And it's just, once again, we're going to pour into you however you need to. Hey, what, what is something, getting to know that person? You know what? I'd, I'd love to go back to school and do, boom, we're going to help you go back to school. Man, I'd love to read more. Boom, we're going to, there's a, there's a room, there's any, anytime you guys want to book, you tell us that we ordered, it's in that room, just check it out like a library. You, and then we're going to have book studies, we're going to talk about it, we're going to bring people in from the outside to constantly challenge us, question us, hold us accountable, you know, make us better. Uh, all those things, right? Those leaders have never arrived and they're just trying to become the best version of themselves, but they're not, they're not doing it for them, they're doing it for the people around them. And, and they really, I think the leader, Travis, has the ability you know, not to, to bark down, but to get beneath them and just, you know, lift them up. So that that's, is that answering your question? Love it. Yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah, I think, I think for me, when I, when we have these conversations, I think it's important to, to, to flesh that out because there's the, there's the, I don't want to say lip service at all, but there's like the articulation of, oh, they've got a great culture. And my question is always, what's it look like? What's it taste? What's it sound like? What's it feel like? Um, to get a glimpse behind the scenes of what what a great culture looks like, and by the way, I think they're they look to your point a lot earlier. It's going to look differently for different places. Different places have might have the same values, but the, how the culture how the culture feels might be slightly different. Anyways, I love that very good articulation. Um, but I think it's such a good conversation because hopefully pe- leaders are thinking, yes, I need to. I want to continue to grow our culture. I want to continue to improve it. And when you hear stories, I think that is a catalyst a lot of times for like, aha, I need to, I need to tweak this. Or man, that way he said something that really, really struck me. I want to, I want to start uh, doing this a little bit better in our company or in our program. Well, I think what's unique to me, Travis, is that there's there's some places that they have the same product and one place might define success one way and another place might define su- success another way and they're both doing great you know it's yeah. not really a right or wrong I, I think I would just go back to that you know hey we're going to have a great deal of conviction in what it is that we're doing why we're doing it and if we have to adjust like there's a lot of people that had to adjust over covid you know, and, and the great businesses and leaders did that. They just didn't kind of sit around. They just tried to find different ways. You know, they didn't make excuses. They didn't complain. And as a result, their businesses flourished because of it. And they thought of things that maybe had COVID never come, they might not have ever thought of. And so, you know, being able to persevere through those things and, and having a sense of resiliency, I think, is a huge one, too. Um, and at least that's something that I would say has stuck out to me on the podcast. What about the podcast for you? Do you find that that those people do something, you know, that the others maybe aren't willing to do? Or are there certain things? Because I guess I see that, you know, like I said, I, I look at that daily discipline or learning or meditation, quiet time. Are, are you seeing the same thing or not? Um. I don't know if if that's come out in an overt way, I think, I think, I think you can probably assume that that's the case. Um, I think for me, and, and by the way, make, uh, I want you, I want you to correct me if I'm not going down the, the path that the question you ask is, is leading me down though. I think the one thing that I see is leaders are the, the really high level leaders. They're really self-aware. They know who they are. 
And when you know who you are, you know, then where you're going, what, how you're going to get there, how it's best for you to get there. You know, um, I was with a, a, a group last night and, and had a uh, head coach um, who kind of was a quote unquote guest speaker. And he's, he's got an edge to him. He's got, um, he's got some snap in him. And yet he has a unique ability to con- to connect to people. I don't know if anyone would be like, oh, he's a connector. But when I see him, I'm like, he completely builds trust. Like guys just trust him. He has this little something. And so I I, I go back and, and, you know, the young coaches that were on this call, I want to communicate to them. Like, if you hear a couple of things and like, oh, that's what I have to do to be successful. It's like, just be careful because he he's his own person. Like he is who he is. And so he has an ability to maybe snap on some kids, but the trust level so deep that if you can't build trust to that depth, or if you're, if you come across as inauthentic, it, it, I just think elite leaders know who they are. They know who they're not. And, um, it, they, they know how to run in their lane, so to speak. Does that answer your, your, yeah, that's your good. question? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, it, it definitely does. I, I would agree with that too. Um, and it, like I said earlier, I think though that I just think they have the ability then within that they just they just have a daily discipline. <laughs> they just they know what they're going to get done, and they you know they yep. get it done, and, and they embrace. However, people want to say it, right? It's 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 mundane. It's boring. Whatever it is, it's it's not to them. They they find some type of joy within that process. But having that self awareness is huge. I, I, w- I would agree. So I think what I think what you're saying, and in, in, uh, yeah, the cl- they have clarity. Elite leaders have clarity. So if you have clarity, you know, going in on Monday morning, what what needs to get done. Like you're just, it, it's so clear to you. Like this is who we are. This is where we're going. This is what we need to do. Um, that that clarity of purpose. That clarity uh, again. There's a thirty thousand book clarity on what are our values, what's the vibe, what's the ethos of our program. But then the clarity of like, what do I do on Monday morning at nine thirty, or what are we doing at practice? What's this drill specifically designed for? And bringing clarity to the to the minutia. Uh, those guys that are with elite clarity, I, I am blown away. That is. That is not me. That's not my number one strength. And so when I see it, when you're around somebody that brings that great clarity to your point, they know what to, they know what they're doing every single day because they have great clarity. I'm, I'm so impressed with guys like that. What, what would you say are some tools or ways for leaders to find out more about themselves? Like how do they come, how do they become more self-aware uh, to who they are and, you brought a really good point to who they're not. I, I, I could argue at times that might be just as valuable. So, so what are yeah. some ways that, that leaders can do that, Travis? Yeah, I'm. I I hope this isn't too simplistic. I think you got to invite you. Got, you got to have the guts, and maybe the the comfort in your own like you to invite people into this journey and say, I need people to speak into this journey. Then beyond that, I think there's tools. There's you know, there's the Enneagram, there's the Myers-Briggs, there's all these assessments that you can, that you can get strengths fine. I mean, we could go on and on. I think if you, I think you've got to bring people into the journey. Like here's one of my, one of the things that, that um, a pet peeve might be too strong of a word, but I'm blown away by coaches that don't do a 360 review with their staff. Yeah. Right. Like I'm, I'm blown away. Like, uh, well, the AD um, does an assessment on me. I'm like, dude, the AD sees you once a week. You put your game face on. He puts his game face on. I want to hear, you should want to know what your young GA says and how he quote unquote grades you or how he assesses you. That is the mark of, of how you're really coming across to people. So anyways, I think having people speak into you, your life, I think getting people around you to share, uh, hey, what are his strengths? What are her strengths? What does she do well? What does he do really well? What are the constraints? What are the things holding him back? How do you come across to people? The, I forget the, the author, but there was a, a book talking about self-awareness. There's the internal self-awareness, the knowing your strengths and your wirings and your giftings. 
And then there's the external self-awareness. How do people experience you? And I'm convinced that most people are just not aware of like how, especially coaches, maybe it might be the same in the business world. They're not aware of how people experience them. So they're, you know, they come in and suck the energy out of the room and they're not aware of it. They're not aware of like, bro, you kill the energy every time we have a staff meeting and they're just not aware because they won't allow people to speak into that. So community. And then I think there's all sorts of different tools you can, you can use, but one of those has to be, in my opinion, some sort of 360 review. I'll flip the question on you. I'm curious, what have you seen work? How do you see people grow in this idea or in, in this self-awareness? Yeah, I don't have much else to add. I think you're right. I, I mean, you know, I think you got to have somebody coaching you per se. I think we all need it. I mean, I, I need it. I, I can't go out and do that if I don't have somebody uh, and like, you know, if, if it's not coaching, it's, Hey, it's me and you hopping on a phone call once a month and connecting within that community. Um, I also think, I guess this would be maybe under that community, but for me, I, I have an accountability partner. Uh, I have somebody that knows everything about me, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and, and I'm, I'm connecting with that person weekly, sometimes daily, depending on what's going on and just, Hey, here's some things that I'm struggling with right now, or here's some things that I'm doing really good. Can you make sure, you know, here's what I need from you. You know, I, I just need maybe encouragement or I need somebody to, you know, tell me to pick it up. I mean, I, I think that's a big one, uh, to be able to have somebody in your life, you know, where you can be everything to, and they can be everything to you in return. Um, I do find, um, you know, I, I use uh, five voices uh, from Giant. I, I think that's kind of a baseline just to get started. I, I think what's really interesting when you do those, I've done four or five myself. There, there's, there's some commonality to all of them, but I think it just gives you a place to start rather than doing nothing at all, right? And so I think the first one, um, man, I remember the first one I did, the disc, and, you know, the lady afterwards who I'd known through a friend was sharing the results with me. And I thought like my wife or mother were like mic'd up somehow and sharing all these things. Yeah. And it was like, you know, I don't know what that thing was, 60 pages. And I'm reading through that thing. I'm like, wow, this is what people perceive me as. Yep. Well, I can do one of two things with that, right? Like I can be like, no, that's not me. No, no way. This is, this is how I am over here on page 17. It says it right here, or it's okay. I can scale back and be like, wow, this is, this is not good. If this is how people perceive me, what can I do to change that and connect with those people? Like, Hey, you know, what are you seeing in me that I can get better at here? Um, so, yeah, I, I think those are really good. I think those are really good resources, but I, I think it's, I think it's really, really important. You, you know, I'll go to it again, what you said earlier, like, Hey, this is just not who I am. I'm not, I can't try to be somebody. I'm not going back to what we talked about initially, the authenticity. I'm not being authentic yep. you know, to my people. If I'm trying to be somebody and you know, as well as I do, people see right through that, right? They, they know, you know, they know. So, yeah. Um, but I think those are, I think those are good resources as well. I love that. Let me throw one thing out. I, I, I'm, I, I, I saw this a few times when I was in ministry, the accountability partner, love it. Think it's awesome. I think that the negative to that accountability partner, there's there's always a flip side to everything. Yeah, right. the, the negative to the accountability partner, or maybe I should say the hole in that, is when a leader has somebody that's outside the organization, only has one person, and that person's outside the organization as their accountability partner, but they don't see on a day-to-day -day what goes on behind closed doors. I think that is where... It's like, okay, that's helpful. Like, I think you're right. Everybody needs that somebody in their life. The problem is, is if he's not getting the right information, then it's like, well, it's, he's not, he's not helping you a ton. You need, you also need somebody inside the organization that sees how you operate on a staff meeting or sees how you operate when somebody made a big time mistake and sees how you dress them down, blew them up, completely demeaned them. Somebody in that environment has to, you have to empower somebody to say, hey, Kevin, dude, I know that was a big mistake that, that Mark made. I want to encourage you to probably handle it very differently next time because you were an a-hole to him, honestly. Dude, what yeah. you just did to him was not humane. 
I want to encourage you. You got to change. So anyways, if, if your accountability partner's three states over and you talk to him once a week and he, you're not going to share, you're not going to, sh- most people aren't going to share like, Hey dude, I actually undressed one of my, one of my direct reports today and made him feel about this small. You're probably just going to, I had a rough one today. I had a, had a tough meeting. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do enough to have just that. I think that's part of it, but I think having people in inside to say, hey, do you know how you come across to people? Just yeah. FYI, it's not good. Or or maybe it is good and that encourages you. So does that make sense? Uh, well, I'm chuckling inside because I literally went through this with a company two weeks ago that's going through the same thing right now. And I challenged them to the same thing. Like you're meeting with this person, these two are meeting with that person. It's just, it's good. It's it's really good. Don't get me wrong. Keep going. There's some growth in that, you know, you know, me being one of them, but over here, you're missing out on, you're not being honest with your people here because that person is never around, like you said. And I think you, I think you mentioned this, but I'll, I'll mention it again. They're, they're controlling that conversation. They're letting Absolutely. that person hear what they want them to hear. And sometimes it's more sympathy and they just want them to, yeah, you know what, Kevin, don't worry about that. You, you, there's no way that you'd be doing that. And, and yeah, so I, I, I couldn't agree yeah. more. That's a great point. Yeah, great point. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go. What, do you got, what do you got next? We're going to. I was going to, I was going to go to the three questions I close with. And I know you close with three questions too. Uh, are you are you good if I yeah, roll these it. out to you? I think okay. So. First one that I always ask is, "What are you currently reading, or maybe you're listening to that's just keeping you sharp, helping you grow?" Yeah, I, I like to read a lot. Um, my podcast, since I live a walk across the street from the office, have gone down tremendously. But I'm always. I'm always, uh, which one did I just, I have for a drive tonight because one of my son, son's game. I have James Clear, my, maybe my favorite book on Ed Milet. So I'm going to be listening to that. And then I also have one from Jane Atkinson, who's like a speaker podcast, really good if you're into that. I am, uh, I am finishing up Win the Day by Mark Batterson with a group of guys right now. That's really good. I just got The Art of Impossible because somebody on my pod uh, mentioned that. Um, and I've just reread and wrapped up the four agreements. Um, so yeah, but I, I've got, I'm really going to try one book a week here next year, Travis, I'll see if I get there, but yeah, I I really like reading. Wow. What, what was the last one? Uh, four four agreements. What is that? The four agreements is, um, well, you're going to put me on the spot here. Um, I forget his, um, I forget his name. It, it was a famous book. I think like Oprah Winfrey and then maybe a president and Kobe Bryant, some of them. Um, okay. It's, it's Miguel, Don Miguel something. Um, it's good though. It's, 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 it's a little deeper, but it, it's good. Love it. Love it. Okay. The second question I ask is what advice would you give a young person? I usually ask, what would you give advice of young person just getting into coaching? I'm going to ask it slightly different for you, young person just getting in 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 leadership. It can be coaching, or maybe they're they mm-hmm. entered the business world and their their goal is to you know to be a CEO one of these days. What what advice do you give? Yeah, boy, I ask that question to others too. When they ask, when, when it's asked of you, that's a tough one. I mean, seriously, where my mind would go right now, and I'll probably text you in 30 minutes and say, I wish I would have said this, but. I would say it's not about you. Mm. That, that, that's I, I would just say it's it's not about you. It's 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 about the people that that you're serving um, and that are quote unquote beneath you. But how do you how do you get beneath them? Like I alluded to earlier. Yeah, love it. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna go with a anything else come to mind. Yeah, I, I just I think some of these things we've already talked about, right? I, I and I really like I didn't I, I haven't heard in our conversations how you put it with with the three, um, and so it's hard for me to say to somebody to to keep connecting if they're not a connector, um, but I think that's important regardless of your personality type. But just to put yourself out there and just go, and if you screw up, just keep going, you know, like. 
it's like doing this podcast. I mean, you just you get on here and you you just go. And, and maybe maybe the the mic wasn't right initially, the lighting or all these other things, but you just keep learning and you keep growing. Uh, and, and really invest in the present. I, I think that might be another thing to tell the young leader too, is just be focused on, on that present moment and who you're with. Like just being locked in and engaged to you right now. You know, just, just having a, a, a general respect for you when it comes to that. But man, I, I'm, I'm so much better than as a result of being on this call with you. Uh, and then that's going to better somebody else, else in my life as a result of it. And so, yeah, I, I, I would go there right now for anything else. Love it. Love it. Okay. This is the last question that I ask, and this is designed to leverage your relational network. So if you're me, or let me, let me ask it this way, who should I get on this podcast? And you know, my podcast, uh, I talk about culture, leadership development, I talk about, you know, strengths, constraints, a lot of what we talked about here. Who would you, who would you encourage me to hop, get, get on this podcast? Tim Kite. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. But I, I, I probably have about 50 other names for you too. <laughs> why, why Tim Kite? Like what, what was the, because you said that really quick, like you didn't hesitate. Yeah, I mean, there was an emotional attachment to that podcast. He just released that article too, about five or six weeks ago. It's the first time he told anybody at stage four cancer was on our podcast. Mm. But um, his response to that, and I, it's his whole methodology, E plus R equals O. You know, for those that haven't heard, it's, it's the event plus your response, and that equals the outcome. And he's, simply put, he's just really, really good, Travis, at, at what he does. Uh, and and that, that in itself is, is something that if somebody can really, you know, control or master, you, you're going to be pretty successful at a lot of things. And, and so... Um, he, he just, uh, I love who he is. I, I love everything about him and what he stands for. Um, and, and I think he's just always constantly pouring into other people with that. But uh, it, would, it would be a great listen. There's not a time where I haven't listened to Tim Kite. Uh, of course, he's only a couple hours away. So I've seen him speak have him on the pod, like I mentioned, and just some other ones that connect him to and listen to him that I just don't take a ton away. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, really good. I, I like that question. All right, well, I can go three questions with you now, right? Do it. And, and this might be a little different because it's solely if I've, I've interviewed you, but you've said enough here today that I think these questions still still work. But if if people could take one thing, you know, from this talk and hold on to it from you, what would you want that one thing to be? I th I think the self awareness piece get around people that will speak truth to you, figure out who you are, your wirings, your giftings, how you, how, how people experience you and grow in health and that like become so there's something so attractive to somebody who's comfortable in their own skin. I think it's the game changer um, of knowing who you are. Now you can't, you can't be a total jerk and be like, well, that's just who I am. Like that doesn't count. No, you, you, you want to be the best version of yourself. You want to be a healthy version of yourself, but there's just something really attractive. Uh, I, I'll share this. I was at a, a deal this summer with some athletic directors and um, you know, around 40 athletic directors visiting at, at some length or another with like, six to 10 of them, you know, and there's a few that I just walk away and I'm like, gosh, I like that guy. And, uh, or I like that gal, like there's something about them. And then I walked away from a couple of conversations where you're just like, I'm not sure just what happened. Like that was, yeah. it wasn't awkward. I'm just not sure what happened. Well, that night I'm processing and I'm thinking, I think the difference between those interactions is one was just really authentic. They know who they were. They weren't trying to posture or promote or flex. They were just, they just were comfortable in their own skin. The other people were a little to, to significantly uncomfortable in their own skin. So a lot of jargon, a lot of cliches, a lot of like, dude, I don't even know what you just said. Like I'm legitimately not. So that it just in my mind it sticks out. Know know who you are. Learn to to know who you are. Learn um, where you got to grow. Get better. Be your best healthy self. But that self awareness in my mind is really key. 
Love it. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. Hey, if you, if you could have stepped into my shoes today, if this was a normal interview and I asked maybe more questions, but we did ask some questions today. What question would have you asked of Travis that I did not ask? Mm. That's a really hard question, man. <laughs> yeah, but it, this is always a good one. Um, or maybe a topic that you were hoping we got to today that we didn't get to. Yeah, I okay, that helps. That's that helps. The first yeah. one felt like it's almost like arrogant, like, oh, you should have asked me about you know that first one felt. I think that I think um maybe this idea of accountability. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'd be curious in in the world of business exactly how this plays out because I think there's a general um, idea of like, man, we want to recruit really good people. We want to develop them at a really high level. We want to care for our people, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you've got somebody that's not performing at a high level or somebody that's done some things and is like, dude, that doesn't fly here. Um, you know, in the business world, they show up late for work constantly, or maybe they just did really, really poor work on a, on a project, or maybe they just blew something up. How do you hold people accountable in a, in a, in a way that um, is uh, humane, that builds people up, but also lets them know that, hey, that crap doesn't fly here. Right. I think that's an art. I think the the, the leaders I've been around um, one, they create a great environment, so there's not a there's there's not a significant amount of accountability that's needed because there's just a great environment that's created. But ne I don't care who you are, if you're dealing with people, there's going to be people that fall short mm -hmm. of the standard and expectations. How do you respond in that moment? I think is a, a deal that either propels your program or your organization or 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 hurts it. So that would probably be the one topic that maybe could have been touched on. It's good. It's good. Well, hey, finally, good stuff is the name of this. Give us some good stuff in closing. Anything that's on your mind right now or in general? Um, yeah, I, I think visiting with a young coach earlier today and um, he asked me a question and, and, I, th I think the, the good stuff that I would share, and I've got a mirror in front of my face right now too, because I need to hear this, but like when you stack a good day, one good day, like you go to work, you do, you do a great job raising family if you have one, being a good spouse, whatever, maybe, maybe, maybe you don't have a family and, and, and you have more, you know, be a great friend read something that sharpens you, write a little bit, do, do something that moves the needle in your career. We'll just talk career since it's kind of our, our thing, you know, we're discussing today. And then tomorrow, do it again. And then the next day, do it again. And the next day, do it again. And these little tiny, these 30 minute, these 45 minute reading or listening or writing, um, they stack up and you look up a year from now or two years from now or five years from now. And you're like, you, you move the needle in your career. I think what we often do is we look at these elite leaders, regardless in the sports world in the business world and ministry or wherever. And we're like, man, that, that dude's awesome. That gal is awesome. There's wow. That we, we, we elevate them. And what we don't see is the incremental growth that they had day after day, after day, after day, that stacks up and it's called exponential growth that happens and it takes off. And we put these people on a pedestal. And then when you get to know them, it's like, dang, dude, they were coaching a division three yeah. baseball team where they were spending most of their time indoors learning to create a practice schedule. Now they're at Vanderbilt. And it's like, well, of course he's elite because he has put in day after day after day. After, and by the way, he's smart, no doubt giftings. You can, you can be there too. Maybe it might not look that way. Maybe there's some giftings that he has that you don't have, but, but, but just be really, really good today. So stack day after day on top of each other. And let the let the 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 uh, interest grow and the long game grow to where there's that um, that that large growth. What is it? The Warren Buffett I think made like seventy percent of all his 
billions of dollars after the age of 60 because of compound interest. And that's, we just, we're too, we, we want things too quick. And if we don't get them by next week, we're out. And so hang in there and keep, keep growing, keep, keep stacking good day after good day. Yeah, that's good. And I, I think that's, that's probably even better than what I said earlier in terms of that daily discipline that I'm noticing from these people that that's just what they well said. They just, they have the daily discipline to keep stacking those days and, and to get through it, even when they're bad and, and just know that it's for something else. So yeah. All right, man. I love it. That was good, man. Let, let, hey, let's talk real quick as we close. Um, I mean, you got you got a great newsletter. I love your newsletter. I mean, just the podcast in general. I, I know this is for maybe my listeners because all your listeners know that already. Uh, just tell us where to find some of these resources, Travis, where to find you online. You've got some great threads on Twitter that I love. I love reading too. So talk about yourself here for a little bit, all right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think the best place is kingdomcoachingtw.com. That's kingdomcoachingtw, uh, my initials, dot com. That's where you can um, sign up for my 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 weekly newsletter. There's In my business, there's one thing that I'm really, really consistent on, and that's I, will, I write a weekly newsletter. My Twitter is the most... In, inconsistent thing of of all time my facebook is no longer my instagram i hate but i'll write it but I'll, i'll write a weekly email every week the other stuff is dude like you it's it's crazy i'll like go six six straight days and then i won't do something for 12 weeks so um twitter's kingdom coach um you can look at it but it's hit, very hit or miss my website and then coaching dna is my podcast um powered by stick and ball TV a group that I've connected with the awesome group of guys. Um, and you can, you know, Apple iTunes, uh, the Spotify, all those, those places. I, I release it weekly. Um, I think I'm releasing now on Thursdays, uh, for my podcast. So kingdom coaching tw.com is my website. And then coaching DNA is my podcast. And I will flip, uh, the script and ask you the same question. Where can, where can people find your stuff? Yeah, right now this is on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and type in good stuff with Kevin, you'll see. I, I think I, I mentioned earlier, if not, I think this is number 72, which is crazy to me. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty active on social media, but it's it's more just releasing information about the show. You know, so some quotes every now and again, maybe a short clip of the video uh, and every now and again, retweeting something or, or sharing a couple a couple thoughts. But um yeah that that's the main thing twitter and instagram uh very similar feeds but it's coach billy b-i-l-l-e doing the same things on linkedin and the facebook page um personally which i guess you'll see more of my kids sometimes on there but uh the the website i haven't done anything with that yet i don't don't want to become more busy uh with, with some of these other things but uh anytime that People want to reach out to me. They can always email me at goodstuffkevin at gmail.com. You know, that's kind of how we get connected with speaking or or maybe it's one-on-one coaching or doing some things with teams. So, um, yeah, I absolutely love it. So thanks for asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, great, this is fun. This has been, this has been fun. Uh, I hope people have enjoyed it as much as I have, Travis. I just, I, I love connecting with you. Like I said, I'm, I've got an hour car ride for my son's game. So I'm, I'm going to be like nonstop thinking about a lot of this already. Um, uh, I got a great deal of respect for you and, and just how you go about things. And I know people are, they're lucky to have you in their life. So keep it up, man. You're doing a great job. Dude, same to you. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I mean that the sharpening effect that you've had on me has been great. We had a conversation kind of setting this up a couple of weeks ago and I took like a, almost a page of notes for like a, 30 minute conversation. You just had, you, you, yeah, you sharpened me. Um, and, and same, same deal. Whoever's working with you right now, I know is, is getting great value. So, uh, yeah, thanks for doing this and to your listeners, keep, keep listening to Kevin cause, uh, you're doing great work. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, if, if you're good to go, we'll wrap up here. Uh, like I said, email wise, you can reach me, you know, that website, of course, to reach Travis at, uh, but thanks again, Travis. Hope you have a good holiday season. We appreciate you being on and allowing us to be on yours as well, which is a great podcast. Yeah. Love it. Love it, dude. Thanks for, thanks for doing this. And thanks for being on Coaching DNA. Yeah, you got it. All right, everybody. Uh, let us know what you think. And until next time, good stuff.